Hi, I'm William Barzi from the British Blacklist, and today I'm joined by Screen Actors Guild award-winning actor Kelvin Harrison Jr. and Emmy-nominated screenwriter Stephanie Robinson, who hold the title of lead actor and writer in the period drama Chevalier. How are you guys? Good, Good. how are you? Yeah. Ah, guys, that was a test to see if you'd be honest, and you both failed. I know it's pronounced Chevalier, and Kelvin... <laughs> Kelvin... <laughs> I can't lie, Kelvin, I know you in particular have said that it makes your toenails curl when it's pronounced incorrectly. It was a full day and a lot of people said it really um, in a really creative way. So I was like, you know. Someone someone earlier, or was it yesterday, said Joseph Bolognese. Oh my God. I, just, <laughs> I, I wondered. <laughs> like, See? Oh my gosh, and she's right. She's right in a way. That is so funny. That is some, like, that's psychological warfare that you just did to us. See, yeah, yeah, both of you were just going to let me get away with butchering it. So if we can't be honest in the safe space, then, like, what? Listen, we're just trying to support. We're just happy. We're, you're here. You're here we're talk. here. <laughs> I'll let it slide. I'll let it slide. It's weird because normally I'm scared about giving away spoilers, but. It's loosely based on history, so is there even such thing as spoiler? But to be on the safe side, could you please tell us what inspired you to write Chevalier and what the essence of this film is about, Stephanie? Um, the thing that inspired me to write Chevalier was his life. It was, it was incredible and is incredible, and everyone should read about it if they get the opportunity to, but I, I don't think that there was any sort of like, I mean, obviously there were, there were deep emotional pulls that I think really inspired me to take on the project, but really, I mean, if I'm being honest, the most, or the biggest thing, the thing that made me the most enthusiastic was just like spreading the gospel of this person. No one knew who he was, and he just truly had, he lived like 20 lives in one. Mm -hmm. um, and no one knew about him, um, at least in my circles. No one was talking about him. I was not taught about him. And I think that was the thing that was like, okay, well, if no one is going to tell this story, I'll endeavor to do so. Yeah, I just felt like that was a great opportunity for you to name drop your mom who gave you the book that, you know, yes. let you know about him. But you know what, if you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. <laughs> my mom. <laughs> Shout out mom. <laughs> shout out my mom. I've been shouting her out my whole life. <laughs> my mom did give me, uh, she gave me a book that mentioned him and um, I'm eternally grateful. I don't think this movie uh, would be here in the way that it is if it wasn't for her. There you go, mom. You listening? See yeah. what you did there? <laughs> <laughs> You're better than me. My mom used to give me loads of books, which I never read. <laughs> but as soon as we're all in and around the same age group here, what I imagine is that around the same time that Stephanie was stumbling across this story in high school, um, it's probably around the same time that um, Kelvin, you were stumbling on your words, trying to get to grips with Shakespeare. Oh so, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know about what? a Midsummer Night's Dream, I know. Oh my God! <laughs> oh. <It's> so funny, <laughs> sometimes I tell that story, but I think I probably said it maybe twice. Um, You're like the Nardwar of movies. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't miss the last one. I was horrible. And my mom literally was like, yeah, that was bad. After I performed it. <laughs> what was bad about it? She was like, the performance. She was like, everything. She, she was like, that was bad. <laughs> so so what, what attracted you to venture back into the world of period dramas with this project, given that experience? I think it was her, Stephanie's script. It was just so dynamic. You know, I, I read scripts and sometimes you kind of go, oh, this is a really interesting concept or this is a really interesting comment on society or, you know, this character is really fun or this director is really, and this was like all around, like something that I would have wanted to do. And I was so moved by how she told the story and then Joseph as an individual, as a, as a character. Um, and then there's all these like fun things I get to do, you know, like, to be, you know, I was like, I looked was them up. The time though, they, in 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 when you look at it, you think it's fun. It's the starting the process, yeah, yeah, <laughs> where yeah. you kind of go, mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you killed it. But you know, you look them up and you see the wig, and you're like, I want to wear the wig with the curls. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how, how deep? Um, when you're talking about the process, how deep did you go for 
for the preparation? Did you drop Kelly Clarkson out of the playlist and switch the classical set? Like, what, what was your what was your process? You know, everything. You listen to Kelly Clarkson? I love like Kelly Clarkson. No, Kelly, Kelly Clarkson. Kelly Clarkson's is, cool. She gets this is it's a song called Piece by Piece, and I listen to it every time I need to get emotional. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> you scared me, dude. <laughs> Um, I did hit the Kelly Clarkson, and then I don't know who was I listening to. I was listening to like Lil Wayne and <laughs> the movie. The movie, yeah, the crazy That's correct. playlist. I want to see if I can find the playlist. What era <laughs> are you talking about? This is the Joseph playlist. Oh my, this is Rip the playlist. Too hard, dedicate, uproar. I'm upset. I'm upset. You I'm know, upset. that was uh, in the beginning of the movie when they were playing with me. I was like, I'm upset. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my, let's see. Oh yeah, anyway, very different playlist. <laughs> <laughs> see, now I'm starting to feel bad about bringing up Kelvin Shakespeare history. So Stephanie, I'm going to ask you to kindly fix this. <laughs> when you were writing Chevalier, were you ever worried about finding someone talented enough to fill that role? And how did Kevin's performance in this preparation ease your anxiety about that? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, oh boy. <laughs> I mean, when, we, when I was writing it, I was so, I think, married to the character and the idea of the character that I actually, I think early on just didn't make space for the actor in my brain. And I never usually write for actors. I usually only write for the character and unless I'm on television where we've already cast the actors, obviously. Um, so when it came time to actually look for Joseph, we cast, I mean, we cast a really wide net, like all over the world, um, across all different disciplines. We were looking at actors, musicians, writers, like people that we maybe, that maybe weren't the obvious choice. And that process was difficult because this was someone, I think that we had been living so long with conceptually in our minds and we knew what he had to do and what he had to be and what he had to convey. And then obviously so much technical skill on top of that. So I think, yeah, there was a lot of fear to find someone who could play the violin, who could fence, who was comfortable in the period clothing, who was uh, enthusiastic about doing the research and embodying this character and really committing themselves. And then obviously Kelvin um, put all those fears to rest kind of immediately. Like I remember the first time watching you play the violin, I was like, wow, like you actually did it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a huge ask to ask someone to not only play the instrument or play an instrument they've never really played before proficiently, but to be a virtuoso, I think with that instrument and then to act on top of playing, like that's a hard thing. So not only was Kelvin playing every violin piece that you see in the movie, he is also playing the violin as Chevalier, which is astonishing to me to be able to do be technically proficient while also acting which is challenging in its own right it's he's incredible she put the circumstances in there you put so much in there <laughs> she's like i'm gonna give you drama i'm gonna give you action i'm gonna give you violin play she's like this man will do everything and you did. i was surprised you didn't put like a dance sequence in there i was waiting for that part <laughs> you have some dancing what? i'm like Oh, you mean mini drivers? Oh, we like, <laughs> forgot about like that. Like hand dancing. The hand dancing. <laughs> A levels <of> quarrel. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kelvin, what's your relationship like with the violin now? Are you guys trauma bonded, or you would never play a day in your life without the right dollar amount attached to it? Um, yes, the second one, bees. <laughs> <laughs> The offering <laughs> it was a lot it was a lot. you put too much time into it and then you kind of like i don't know it was stressful and then you know you have to leave you when you leave the character you also leave all their gifts <laughs> oh man it's good it's good it's good to see you're feeling a bit better now that we've given you the rightful praise for your talent and um stephanie touched on like all of the amazing talents that you have and i'm sure that stephanie you yourself are used to probably hearing the words exceptionally talented if you're not I'm going to make sure that I say that now you're exceptionally talented and the incredible work that you've both been able to put together over the course of your careers, which are relatively young, but I'm sure that you're also both familiar with the phrase black people can't, of, don't have the privilege um, of being average. And to some extent, the early portions of Joseph's life are kind of a manifestation of this necessity to be exceptional in order to survive in a system that wasn't really built for him to succeed. 
Um, to what extent um, were you guys both able to relate to that feeling? So much. I, I think that's why I wrote the movie or why we started it the way that we did. It really is a journey, like an interior journey of someone who is struggling with that, who is exceptional and is talented and should be celebrated for those things. Absolutely. But it's sort of like, I think, getting at the trauma behind that and why that is and can a person just be enough as they are and the um the use of of being exceptional or successful as armor and as a defense mechanism is an incredibly real thing and it's it's something that I don't think that I've shed completely yet but I very early on in my career felt it every single day every single day um and it's still absolutely there hopefully hopefully getting better but it's it's a real thing yeah well said i felt the same way i mean i I talk about my high school experience a lot which i'm sure you probably already know about (laughs) 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 but yeah i was just saying the other night dude that i used to i got into the school because of the fact that because i wasn't like the most like i wasn't like the tester you know what i mean the dude that made the best grades or whatever like that but I played them. I played instruments, and so they would put me on like the arts brochures, and I would perform at the luncheons and like the orientations. Mm-hmm. And it, was, but it was like no one actually asked anything about me. You know what I mean? It was just kind of like he's he's the face You're of the, the we have of arts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was really awkward. And I didn't. I used to. I used to take pride in it for a long time until I realized what that was. And then you know, obviously, I might still be a little bitter because <laughs> I'm talking about it so much. Well, it does. I mean, it does leave you with a chip on your shoulder, for Mm -hmm. sure. And that's like another stage of the healing from it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely can't relate to, you know, the feeling of being exceptional. But, you know, you know, so it it sounds sounds like Uh, a bit of a burden. (laughs) 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 I'm I'm only playing, guys. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, Joseph was also known as La Mosa Noir, which translates as the Black Mozart. Yeah, I've been practicing my, my elocution on this one. <laughs> and I joked about the pronunciation um, earlier at the beginning of the interview, but on a serious note, there are people who might not know um, what the film was about off the name alone. And I think it was a very bold choice to not name it the Black Mozart, given the familiarity of like Mozart's legacy um, in the public sphere and how easier it probably would have been to market. I mean, normally when you add black to the front of things, it works, you know, Black Panther, Black Mirror, Jay-Z's 2003, the Black Album, but (laughs) you guys went for Chevalier. Uh, Stephanie, I just wanted to ask you why you chose to steer away from that comparison. And also Kelvin, I would love to know, would you even feel comfortable being attached to a film named The Black Mozart? The the Black Mozart bit was just never even in my brain. At any point Mm -hmm. during writing this movie or researching it or, when we were in production, it just never, ever came up. And the only time it did come up was when I think the movie was announced and it was everybody else who then labeled it like Black Black Mozart Mozart. because it was like the only way that they could relate to what we were doing. But it was never even part of the conversation. It was always Chevalier. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wouldn't have done it. (laughs) I'm Black Mozart, like, this weird. I don't know if I trust these people. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> um also it's just it's just i don't know listen the name's cool chevalier <laughs> and that's what it's called um i wasn't there a new york times article though that came out or something was it before or after the movie it was after the the movie was announced i think the new york times yeah. what did they write they wrote something about um that he was more than just the black mozart, mozart. yeah and that was really which was cool. great it was a really yeah. powerful piece I, I applaud you for making the decision because it's amazing to see us stand in our own light and our own truth because both are strong enough to captivate audiences and we don't need to lean on proximity to whiteness like as a crutch. And on that note, actually, before I let you go, I just need the answer to one more serious question. Um, I can overlook some of the inaccuracies for entertainment purposes, but it was a lot harder for me to suspend disbelief when I saw how clear Calvin's skin was the whole film. And I didn't see an ounce of moisturizer. <laughs> I've I've seen I've seen your get ready with me glossier YouTube videos. So I know you know what I'm talking about, guys. Just just answer that one question. I'll let you go. You know it's so funny though. That was a Stephen decision. <laughs> Steven, I was like, can you have a little grit? He was like, no, he's beautiful. <laughs> and I was like, all right. <laughs> 
So yeah, that's that's where it well, because that's what they described him as. It's beautiful skin. But also I, people say Joseph was beautiful he like was that. Beautiful. So yeah, he was wanted true. to up it. You know what I mean? <laughs> 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 appreciate your time guys thank you so much for the film the contribution and for bringing this story to light i look forward to speaking to you both again i look forward to everyone else seeing this film thank you thank man. you so nice, nice to, meet to meet you, you. that was great